On to our next speaker, after majoring in political science from the University of Houston, Ms. Trost is currently a teacher and debate coach of HSSI. When she isn't preparing her kids for competition, she loves spending time with her family, writing, and art. Tonight, she plans on leaving us in tears. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda Trost.
I scratched my face with my middle finger, giving her a smirk. I answered all my test questions with, you are a B, I, that didn't work, I guess. I started rumors about her and taught classmates a song to sing at recess that I'm embarrassed as an adult to even think of repeating. And that did work. At the end of about a week, she told me that until things got better, I was staying after school with her for detention. I couldn't imagine spending one more second with this woman. We waited together in after school detention, either in complete silence or with me slinging random obscenities and so my mom came to pick me up, sometimes at 6.30 or 7 p.m. I didn't get it. I didn't get it until 2009, I had an assignment teaching fifth grade. I didn't get it until a student of mine showed up looking like he was drowning. I didn't get it until he asked me to keep a secret, and I couldn't. His mother's boyfriend broke into their apartment while he was getting dressed for school, and pinned him against the wall. Within what seemed like seconds, we were sitting in the school counselor's office. We were meeting with police. And then walked his mother, claiming that his allegations could never be true. Wow. The routine at his house was for my student to get home at about four, and his mom worked until six. The next day, I asked him if he wanted to stay after school and help me with some things, so that it could be his mom that picked him up and not her said yes. And then I went home, went through three different wrong Denver Palcots in the phone book, and finally reached my fifth grade teacher. I asked her if she remembered me, and she laughed. Of course, how could she not? In fifth grade, aside from sticking out, I'm sure, because I was a complete mess, I stuck out because I was the tallest in my class. True story, and now I'm five foot two. <laughs> she said she bet I was tall and man was I a model, which is hilarious because today is the first time all year I've worn makeup. I don't wear a pair, I don't own a pair of heels. Uh, I'm not even sure I've ever touched a piece of designer clothing. But it's funny also because my fifth grade mind wouldn't have been able to conceive being beautiful. I was caught up in being angry and weird. She told me she worried about me over the years. She said that I wasn't as bad of a student as I thought I was, which I find really hard to believe. I needed to hear her confirm it. You didn't keep me after school to punish me. You kept me to keep me safe, right? Fighting back tears, I apologized every way that I knew, and somehow I could tell that she had accepted my apology before I was ever given. Thank you, Ms. Palka. It's very possible that you saved my life. And thank you for being your shooting. For my childhood mind, Miss Palcott was the bad guy. I couldn't understand she wasn't trying to ruin my life, but was bound by state law to report what I had told her. I didn't understand that she was sacrificing her personal life to stay after school and protect me. For you hearing my story, I'm sure that my dad was the bad guy. And he was, and he wasn't. Before I was born, before alcohol and brain injury, he served in the army and as a Boy Scout troop leader. The man who on two occasions banged my head against a cast iron bathtub and choked me until I passed out is the same man who helped me learn to read, taught me to drive, started my savings account for college, and somehow without a job, managed to scrape together enough money for books when I ran out my freshman year. My family tells me that he loved me. I think that I believe them. How can someone you love be a hero in his past and a monster in your present? How can someone that you thought ruined your life be the one instrumental in saving it? The theory of cognitive dissonance states that we feel uncomfortable when presented with two different opposite truths. We do whatever is necessary to rationalize these truths and to make them one. If you get caught sneaking candy in the grocery store before you pay, you might tell the clerk, yeah, I was just sampling it, right? 
I've heard so many people that smoke a pack a day and know it causes cancer and heart disease rationalize it by saying that their 82-year-old grandfather smoked his whole life. Or they might tell you something along the lines of, yeah, doesn't everything cause cancer? It's like eating a Big Mac and thinking that a diet soda really makes a difference. Cognitive dissonance and I have had our fair share of issues, and I've come to the conclusion that that uncomfortableness we feel is worth embracing, and that adopting a fallacy for the sake of putting things into neat little boxes can do a lot of damage. I'd like for you to think of cognitive dissonance, of accepting two sides of things as a stretch. It hurts to stretch, but the more that you breathe, sit still, and relax into it, the easier it is. Was my dad a monster or a hero? He was both. Our world does not consist of good guys or bad guys on separate teams. It consists of people, each with hopes, dreams, successes, failures, deserving of love, forgiveness, and second chances. So easily, we get drawn into thinking that either we like someone or we don't. How can so quickly we dismiss that people are worth our time, worth our effort, or that they're all good or all bad? Often we make these decisions instantly, without logic, based on one event, or when we or the other person is at our worst. Consider the breakup of a family. Fights with friends. Even fights with your neighbors, like my neighbor whose dog barks 23 and a half hours a day. Someone says something, someone else gets mad, and a feud is born. Often years go by and we don't even know what started it in the first place. Our rifts stem universally from misunderstandings. Accusations of wrongdoing that we don't even understand. Accusations of not caring, of choosing one person over another. We get mad because we claim that the other person was mean first, or we don't like someone because we think that they didn't like us. The same is true in the workplace. A coworker takes something personally or appears to, and then for whatever reason, suddenly, not only do we not like them, we hate them. We're drawn by some magnetic force to pull other people aside and tell them all the juicy details. We embellish whatever story our mind created out of a cognitive dissonance to explain why he is now the jerk. In traffic, we know that ridiculousness, right? The person who cuts you off instantly becomes all that is wrong with humanity. It could be the sweetest little old lady, and then all of a sudden, you want to kill her. Often at work, at home, at school, like I did with this podcast, we rationalize things so far away from the truth. We attempt to protect ourselves, to set things straight with some semblance of us being innocent and the other person being a representation of pure evil. I convinced my friends, or I tried to, to not like Miss Pelcott because she had a smelly butt. <laughs> and that's the clean part of the song that I wrote. But it's not like I was gonna tell them, well, Miss Pelcott tried to help me, but I couldn't see it that way, so let's go put thumbtacks on her chair. We don't often realize both anger and blame are completely irrelevant in making things better. A few months ago, the house of a good friend of mine was broken into. Her three-year-old couldn't wait to tell me, Amanda, the bad guys took our stuff and the bad guys broke our window. But in the morning, when he said his daily prayers, he was insistent upon putting them at the top of his list. I am not religious. But the fact that he wanted God to bless these men with the best that he had to offer to protect them, to enrich the lives of these people that we saw as scum, to love the thieves that stole his sense of safety, is amazing. How beautiful would it be if we all felt that way? For the remainder of my fifth grade year, through middle and high school, and even after that, I saw myself as a victim of circumstance. I would not have been able to tell you at the time that that was the way I was the kid that honestly thought not doing my homework hurt the teacher and not myself. I blamed others for getting into and staying in bad relationships and dangerous situations. I failed at a lot of things thinking it was someone else's fault. It's
it very easily could have been me who was the criminal instead of me who was the teacher. It's a miracle that I finished school and I wandered back into education after hating being a student all those years. I think it's kind of surprising that as my friends tell me, I'm relatively normal, all things considered. Cognitive dissonance, two sides of things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all rolled into one. What do we do? Love each other, unconditionally. This doesn't mean that you have to be stepped on. At 16, I decided I'd had enough of my dad's temper and of my mom covering up for him, and I left. Spending as much time away as possible, juggling part-time jobs, and sleeping on bedrooms of friends' floors. I understood what they could and could not give me, and I loved them. It was what it was. Respect each other. Understand you never know someone's full story, and act with that in mind. Think to yourself when you're frustrated, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. People do things differently than you do. Wish them success. People do things that you know are horribly wrong. Wish them the best. Give second chances, and third, and fourth. Aim to see the good in people, and learn to take deep breaths and stretch.